Okay, so let's get started. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to our new season of uh, talks uh, at the Gonda Center. And it was really important for us to start with a bang. So I was uh, looking for somebody who is a world leader and a pioneer of uh, many fields related to our research. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Chaim Sampolinski as our opening act. Uh, Chaim, for those who, who don't know, um, received his PhD in physics from Bar Ilan University in, in 1980. Then he went to see to this postdoc at, at Harvard University in the physics department with uh, Bertrand Halperin. And then after two years, uh, he was appointed as an associate professor of physics at Bar Ilan University. So he was back with us. Um, and in 86, he got a position in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he moved there to be a professor of physics in Jerusalem, where he still resides, at least part time. Uh, professor Sampolinski's research uh, was initially in theoretical physics, and I'm sure still uh, is for some, some extent before he expanded. But basically, back then, he was already a luminary physicist covering fields in phase transition, critical phenomena, nonlinear dynamics statistical mechanics of spin glasses and more. And I always love seeing such huge figures being able to import or export their uh, uh, expertise from one field to our own uh, very dear neuroscience. So in the mid eighties, he was a pioneer, one of the pioneers, a handful of them if, of computational neuroscience that now it's, it's hard to call it even a field. It's much more than a single field, but he was there and still there and still a leader. Uh, introducing methods from physics uh, and statistical mechanics, nonlinear dynamics, and random systems to the study of principles underlying the relation between structure, dynamics, and computation in neural circuits. I just read this list and I feel like I wish I could have much more time with Chaim just talking and, uh, and learning more from him. Uh, his research also in neuroscience already spans a broad range of topics, including chaos in neural circuits, Emergence of excitation inhibition by a balance in the brain, which also interests me a great deal personally. Attractor manifolds in spatial computations, neural memory and learning, coding and dec decoding of information, and much more. Uh, my biggest surprise for him, I mean, when we get to the title of today's talk, it's, it's another surprise. Every talk that I hear from him, it's like it's a different researcher doing something completely different. But when we held in the, in the, in the center a few years back, um, conference on uh, on the free will and agency and volition. Uh, I also came and, and gave a talk also on this field. So you can see that uh, his mind is, is broad and sophisticated enough to encompass uh, so many careers in one person. So I think this is amazing. He also helped in founding many centers, specifically uh, the, uh, the Center for Neural Computation, the ICNC in the Hebrew University, which I think then turned or in parallel then opened the Edmund Aliri Safra Center, Brain Sciences, which is the current uh, center in, in Jerusalem for brain science. So he was also the founders and still in the executive board. So he does a lot in scientifically and also for the community. And for this, uh, we're highly appreciative. He also runs a center at Harvard University. So I don't know if he also has only 24 hours in his day, but it seems like he has more. Uh, and accordingly, he has won numerous uh, um, prestigious awards. Uh, he's the uh, uh, honorary foreign member of the American Academy of Sciences. He received in the, uh, the Lando Prize, uh, Mathematical Neuroscience Prize, Swartz Prize, and, uh, and the most recent uh, in 2016. Yeah, the Met Prize for Life Sciences in Brain Research. So highly accomplished, and we are highly privileged to have you here today with us, Chaim. And uh, today the talk will be about object representations in brain and mechanics, and the floor is yours, Chaim. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the generous introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, object representations in, in brains and machines. Uh, you will see the connection uh, later on in my talk. Um, I'll start with the introduction, which um, for most of you is uh, kind of basic and trivial, but will set the context, or maybe even historical context uh, for, for my, uh, my talk. Uh, I'll then talk, uh, discuss um, uh, the elements of a, a theory or a new theory that uh, I and my colleagues have developed uh, about uh, object manifolds, um, measure of their separability and the geometry. And then I'll uh, go on to um, 
to apply uh, the, this uh, theory or the, the tools that the theory has uh, allowed us uh, to develop, uh, apply them to get insight into uh, the nature of object manifolds, uh, object representations in the visual system. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, finally, I hope I'll have time to talk also about a related concept, which is how uh, the brain uh, might learn uh, new concepts or new, new objects with a very uh, little uh, experience uh, about them. And then uh, I'll conclude. Okay, so before I uh, begin, I I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor Dan Lee from Cornell Tech in New York and Samsung uh, AI. Su Yung Chang uh, was a PhD student at Harvard uh, with me, uh, and now she's a postdoc in Colombia. Uh, ben uh, Socher uh, started at Harvard. Now he's a graduate student with Sua Ganguly at Stanford. And Uri Cohen is a senior PhD student on his way to a postdoc uh, at the Hebrew University. And I acknowledge General's funding from various uh, foundations. <clears throat> so the context is to uh, a, a, a decades long um, uh, uh, attempt to understand how um, the brain generates um, perception in vision. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's, of course, sorry. Mm -hmm. Of course, more generally, uh, in the sensory system, from uh, the uh, journey of the photons impinging on the on the photoreceptors uh, on the retina, uh, then to uh, uh, then to uh, the cortex. But uh, the first uh, uh, stage or the first set of stages, which called early vision, would be from the retina to primary visual cortex V1. Uh, and that early attempt uh, already uh, started in the 30s of the previous century, uh, the famous work by Hartline, where uh, he established the nature of the receptive fields in, uh, in the retina. Uh, and in particular, the discovery of centers around uh, a receptive field in um, the axons coming out of, uh, of the retina. Uh, uh, circular receptive fields. So those those uh, neurons love uh, and like and respond to uh, a very simple physical uh, uh, stimulation, a spot of uh, a light in the center or darkness in the center. Um, however, when uh, the light uh, then propagates uh, from the retina to to the brain or to the to the cortex in in V one. Um, uh, as you all know, Eubin Wiesel discovered uh, decades later uh, that the cells uh, have also a receptive field, they're also localized in space, uh, but the structure of the receptive field is different and the neurons are primarily um, are selective to orientation. So that led to kind of Gabor, mapping of Gabor-like receptive field down here at the, at the bottom right where you have uh, an elongated receptive field with a center, excitatory center uh, region and, um, and flanks uh, in inhibitory or, or vice versa. Uh, we call them Gabor filters or Gabor receptive field and the related uh, topic of uh, the related property of orientation tuning with the cell, in this case, a narrowly, relatively narrowly uh, selective cell responds uh, to uh, a restricted range uh, of the orientation of uh, of the bar or the grating that um, appears on uh, or moves in on, on its uh, receptive field. Uh, so, so this uh, this type of um, mapping of single unit properties, receptive field, and the properties within the receptive field. What are uh, the selectivity of uh, of these neurons? Uh, was uh, was very uh, productive and uh, revolutionary at the time. Um, uh, and led to uh, a vast uh, amount of also theoretical uh, research uh, and utter progress on understanding theories of early vision over the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, uh, and uh, the, here are some examples. So, for instance, understanding the nature of the receptive fields in, in those early stages um, with the topic of efficient coding and information theory by a variety of uh, of uh, of researchers 
And for instance, it, it culminating in, in what's known as uh, ICA, independent component analysis uh, or sparse coding uh, theories, um, which, uh, which actually predicted that uh, recept that, uh, that in cortex will have a, 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 an area where um, neurons will have receptive fields. So each square here is one filter or one neuron um, and, and, and the receptive field of this, uh, of this set of neurons, as you see, are very much like Gabo filter. So it's, it, it's nice to have a, a first principle uh, a theory, uh, which actually um, predicts uh, the type of receptive field that I actually observe uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in, in V1. Um, at the same time, there, were, uh, progress in, uh, there was progress in understanding um, circuit mechanisms that uh, might actually implement and give rise to this type of, uh, of properties. Um, and they, they focus on local cortical circuit in V1. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the, go, the, the role of uh, excitatory uh, cortical connections in amplifying and sharpening uh, those, uh, uh, those tuning curves uh, gave rise to the, to the um, um, to the theory of ring attractors uh, and um, uh, and to uh, <clears throat> to the idea that cortical uh, cortical uh, feedback excitatory feedback can si uh, amplify signals and can give rise to sometimes to what's called symmetry breaking and and a manifold of uh, of uh, ring attractors which then uh, uh, also uh, were shown. Uh, or co uh, consistent with, with discoveries uh, uh, to, uh, recent years in the fly uh, navigation systems and uh, two-dimensional rendering of the, those in, uh, uh, in the grid cell uh, system. Uh, and um, uh, in, the, in the bottom right, you, you, you see another, another uh, theory, an example of a theory, of, again, of my group in the mid-90s about the role of inhibition cortical inhibition, uh, again, inhibitory feedback in, uh, in uh, sharpening the selectivity, generating neural variability, and most importantly, stabilize cortex against massive uh, excitatory feedback. So this was some of the samples of uh, the progress that in, the th in, in the theory of um, visual, uh, early vision, visual representations in uh, primary visual cortex. But what, what next? So, uh, okay, so most of you, uh, of course, know the, uh, the story about the pa two parallel main uh, pathways of uh, what and where, uh, the dorsal stream of, uh, of where and the, and the ventral stream of what, which we'll be primarily interested today about. So the idea is that in the ventral stream, you have an image with an object, an animal, a face or a house or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, uh, representations uh, then uh, are transformed, these signals are transformed uh, from one representation to the next. So you start from pixel layer, we go to the retinal ganglion cell, to the, uh, to the LGN, to V1, V2, etc. And then uh, we get to IT, which is kind of the, a, a set of uh, stages or maps or <clears throat> in the, <clears throat> at the top of the visual hierarchy. <clears throat> and then uh, the idea is that um, those, uh, <clears throat> those representations somehow uh, help cortex build a nice object representations in, <clears throat> in IT cortex for identifying or, or object for tracking them, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so how do we understand what's going on in this uh, series of stages and what's going on in IT? Uh, so the natural uh, um, kind of generalization or extension of the human weasel work was to try to map the individual receptive fields of neurons uh, in, uh, in, in higher areas, like in V2 and V3 and V4. And indeed, the, <clears throat> the, the was important uh, work trying to do such a uh, kind of taxonomy. So you start from simple cells here, then you go to complex cells, to end stop cells, curvature cells, P cells, sparse cells, part of object cells, etc., etc. But there were, for several reasons, they didn't really, uh, uh, wasn't really satisfactory. 
One of them, it was very heterogeneous and it wasn't clear whether, what, what are the principles behind the measures of a collection of receptive fields in, in one area versus the other. Um, the other one, the, 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 reason, the, the second reason was that it turned out, but, but most importantly in, in higher order uh, visual areas that the notion of receptive field starts to lose its, uh, its force because it was highly contextual, nonlinear. So uh, there was beyond receptive field uh, uh, properties and so on and so forth. So it didn't really work out very, as well as it was in early, uh, early vision. Um, similar, I would say, uh, setback uh, also happens in computer vision attempt to build machines uh, that do uh, vision like humans, uh, vision task. Um, and again, uh, the, the, the idea was to start kind of encoding head design, hand designed set of features, low level features, mid level features, high level features, and then at the end, some trainable classifier. <clears throat> but again, this didn't work out, didn't seem to lead to systems which are machines algorithms which are power enough to actually uh, uh, give, uh, give rise to functionality at the level that is interesting or human-like. Uh, okay, and in recent years, it was the, the growing realization that the problem of uh, object perception is really a challenging problem because the, the variability uh, that associated with the physical uh, instantiation of an object is enormous. And the variability between two instantiations of the same object can be far larger than the variability between uh, a, 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 an example uh, images uh, for, from two objects. Uh, so, you know, there is orientation, scale, uh, translation. This is an examples of an object. This is examples of pose uh, variability in, uh, in faces. Uh, and again, down here, uh, images, rich images of, of an object of, or, or an animal, cat, uh, dog, mug, hat, and so on. Uh, the enormous variability of uh, pictures that most of them we don't have difficulty to, uh, to identify as, as, a, as a mug or, or a dog despite the richness of backgrounds, the variability of sometimes occlusion or other, other things in, in the image, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So um, this uh, was seemed to be a very difficult problem uh, and indeed it's a challenging problem. Uh, however, a breakthrough uh, or sort of breakthrough appeared uh, in 2012 uh, where uh, uh, after a series of uh, annual con uh, competitions uh, uh, for object uh, recognition task uh, in, in machine vision called ImageNet competition, there was a, there was a success which kind of showed uh, uh, how to uh, how to go about uh, this problem. So the the challenge of uh, ImageNet, uh, many of you may know or heard about it. It's about a uh, million images. Um, examples are shown here. Uh, about they are they are arranged in about fourteen hundred categories. So roughly between six hundred and thousand images per uh, per category. Um, and um, so uh, the task is to um, train a system uh, to uh, uh, to do to recognize them on on some on some of course test images and uh, as you uh, all know the deep networks um, uh, won that competition uh, at that year so here is kind of a diagram uh, what you see it on top is the arrow uh, and and percentage arrow but you should remember it's one out of thousand so uh, uh, this is this is a, a random uh, error will be will be high about ninety percent of course. Uh, so the the shallow uh, showed some modest uh, some nice nice uh, nice performance, but uh, but still not good enough. Uh, then uh, a network uh, AlexNet uh, in two thousand twelve uh, from Hinton's uh, Jeff Hinton's group uh, uh, showed a remarkable uh, 
the decrease in in error uh, uh, improvement in in, uh, uh, in performance um, with a, a neural network with eight eight layers uh, and uh, that uh, showed that deep structures um, uh, can be trained to perform this task and indeed uh, over the years the the depth of the network these are these uh, white numbers inside the bars uh, show the depth uh, grew and with the growth of depth um, the the performance went down it's now uh, below uh, the error is below human uh, human error okay uh, here's examples of such networks they're called deep convolutional networks and briefly because you have a, the the image a pixel layer then you have a set of stages uh, most of the stages, except for the last ones, are convolutional, so they are very much like uh, neurons in, uh, in in the visual system. So a neuron here is a, a node here is a filter looking at a at, at a small um, patch or square in the uh, in the previous in uh, in the image in uh, of its input in the previous uh, stage uh, and uh, the the weight. This, uh, in which it sums those pixels or those uh, uh, those inputs from from the previous stage are, are learned are trained uh, and um, but these weights are copied or shared among uh, neurons that uh, are, are the same filters but looking at different parts of the uh, of the input so it is it is like a spatial two-dimensional convolution now there are of course in parallel many many other filters so it's a stack of filters doing convolution with different uh, spatial weights or different width, uh, filters on the uh, on the image and and this kind of this nonlinearity and it's copied uh, stage by stage uh, the last stages are kind of fully connected and then and then the, on top of it there is a, a classification layer says this is dog cat um, house time or whatever uh, it's mostly object and not, not faces but um, Anyway, so uh, here is an example of a, 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 a deeper network, VGG, uh, and then uh, some of the most modern ones are called ResNets for reasons that I, I won't go into this, but they are long and I'll show some examples of uh, performance of them. Okay, so this is called DCNN, Deep, Deep Convolutional Neural Networks, and they are kind of what uh, uh, are, are, are doing very very uh, impressive uh, job on on object uh, uh, like task. Okay, so in, in a way we want to understand how these machines are doing it. Not it's it's kind of a similar problem, and and we can think about those as kind of artificial brains, uh, which are, are 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 not designed, are not engineered. Well, the architecture is engineered, but the actual weights, synaptic weights, if you want to call them, uh, are trained by um, supervised learning uh, algorithms. So we'd like to understand what is going on here that enables those uh, machines to do this. So it's a kind of a shared problem, understanding brains and machines, uh, how they do object uh, classification tasks. Okay, so I am going to show brief, to talk briefly about a theory, uh, and, and the theory, I call it the macroscopy theory of object representation. It's macroscopy because I'm not going to pay attention to what a single neuron is doing or to map the receptive field or the tuning curves of single neurons. I kind of abandon this seemingly hopeless uh, attempt or, or agenda. I'm going to uh, actually advise or advertise uh, a, a complementary approach which looks at the properties of the population, how the entire population or entire stage or an area um, in either artificial or, or the brain or uh, a, how they handle uh, objects uh, as, as, a, as the collective uh, property. Okay, so uh, the, the qualitative uh, uh, idea uh, uh, is uh, is the idea of uh, uh, untangling perceptual manifolds. So again, the same story as before in the ventral stream. Uh, but now here downstairs, it's a, a cartoon by Di Carlo and, and David Cox, which kind of uh, uh, introduced the idea of untangling object uh, perceptual manifolds. So a manifold is one of those kind of membranes 
which is a, a collection uh, of all the points and each uh, that that are uh, represent uh, an object or, or, or face or an animal and so on. So uh, the manifold leaves are embedded in uh, in the in the high dimensional space of the population response. So, for instance, in the pixel layer, each point here is um, n-dimensional vector where n is the number of pixels, uh, a million or several million, depending on the resolution and so on. And in these points, uh, because so the, the, if, you, if you vary the, the face in uh, lightning, in uh, translation and so on, you, you have many, many points representing the same face, <coughs> you, you can connect them into and, and think about them as a membrane, as a manifold. And then another, another face like Sam would be another manifold. But these two manifolds are very nonlinear, very convoluted, very entangled with each other. So it will be very hard for the brain <coughs> downstream to actually read out object identities directly from the representation in pixel in the retina. So uh, this uh, type of representations or information, visual information is reformatted as, you, as, the, as the signal propagates from one stage to another. And then in IT cortex, it's, there is no new information, but it's the same information, but now it is kind of flattened those manifolds so that each one of them are nicely, so this pair of manifolds are nicely separated and can be then classified or discriminated uh, or categorized by downstream neurons looking or re receiving input directly from, uh, from this uh, IT representation. So that's kind of the general uh, the general idea about perceptual manifolds and untangling them. Importantly, what is an empirical uh, observation, both from recordings in IT cortex and also from recordings or inspecting the corresponding top layers in artificial deep convolution networks, the, the representation is not invariant. So, uh, Joe is not represented by a single point in this uh, population uh, uh, space, um, which means that you can read out actually information about the location of an object, the pose of a, of a face, uh, the orientation of, a, of an object, etc., from IT cortex uh, representation. Uh, so they are not the representation themselves are not invariant, but somehow they are good enough, they are entangled enough uh, to allow downstream uh, object, uh, invariant object uh, uh, computations. Okay, so the question is, uh, how, do we, how do we quantify the degree of uh, entangleness or separation uh, of, uh, of manifolds in a representation? Uh, and what are, what are the relevant geometric measures? So going back to here, uh, how, how geometrically we characterize the, uh, the shape of the manifold, the distance between them, and so on, the dimensionality of the manifold, uh, in a way which uh, illuminates the degree of separability. Uh, so, um, uh, here's the idea. So the, we start with the idea of a linear classification of manifolds. So uh, here again, some uh, uh, cartoon of a high dimensional embedding space. Uh, each axis here corresponds to the activity or the response of one neuron. So if there are thousands of neurons in, in, in a layer, this will be thousand dimensional space, can be million dimensional space. Uh, and, and again, the, the manifold is the set of points uh, of uh, uh, responses of uh, neurons in this uh, in this stage to one physical instantiation of a, a one object. So uh, here it will be uh, uh, the manifold corresponding to a dog. The red one here down here is the manifold corresponding to a cat, and so on. And in order to assess their separability, we we uh, stick to the notion of linear separability. 
which means linear classification, which means we give all the points in one manifold label plus one, all the points in another manifold label minus one, and uh, we ask whether uh, a hyperplane can uh, appropriately oriented can actually do the job of giving uh, you know all the points of plus one on one side of the hyperplane, all the points of minus one on the other side of hyperplane. So they are called linearly separable. So it's a manifold given a label, and the label is uniform within a manifold, but vary from one manifold to another. Now it turns out that just to think about two manifold is too simple. In high dimension, uh, it's very easy to separate two manifolds, even if it looks to us in three dimension very, very uh, uh, crumpled and, and, and tangled. Uh, high dimension does wonder to separate things. Uh, so you have to you have to think more uh, uh, more sophisticated and think about many uh, many manifolds uh, embedded in the same in the same space. So here you have you know a manifold of cat and a manifold of a house and a car and manifold and dog manifold and so on and so forth. And now we are doing the same game. We are saying let's for simplicity do a binary classification task, which means that we take half of those manifold here and give them a label plus one, half of the manifold giving them a label minus one. And now you can see visually that it's kind of challenging to uh, find a hyperplane that will separate all the plus ones categories from the minus one categories. So that's the idea of classification of a set of manifolds that say P manifolds, P can be 100,000 in ImageNet, like the maximum P is about a thousand categories. So it will be like P of this, uh, of this cloud. And the point is, we are now giving the labels on the manifold random, because we want to really, we don't want to think about a specific task, like separating all the animates from the inanimates or all the objects that I saw in the last 10 years from those that I didn't, and, and so on and so forth. We want to, have a characteristic or a generic characteristic of their separability. So the way to do it is to say, well, let's randomize the labels and see uh, after doing this experiment many, many times, what is the probability that uh, I'll be able to separate uh, a, 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 this type of dichotomy or, or classification task by hyperplane. So how many randomly labeled manifold can be linearly classified? And what is the underlying geometry? So that's kind of the formal definition of, of what I'm going to do. Okay, so uh, just one, one more mathematical word is about what I mean by manifold. So a manifold will be, again, set of points in very high dimension, n dimension. But I'm assuming that the manifold itself, the points on the manifolds are spent in lower dimension, dimension d. So all these points here are in kind of d dimension. And then within this d dimension, there is some shape, and the shape uh, the not by n doesn't matter. So, for instance, for d dimensional ellipsoid, the famous formula for an ellipsoid in d dimension is that the square of the coordinates in this in, in, of the ellipsoid uh, on the surface of the ellipsoid uh, divided by the radii square is one. Okay, this doesn't matter, but the idea is that we have low dimensional structures uh, uh, d. Uh, in spanning in, in D dimension, and they they leave many of them live in 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 the same n dimensional uh, home. All right, okay. We make the following assumptions. So let's go back to this picture. We make uh, it's easy to to show in the picture. We make the assumption that the position. So think about the center of each one of these blob as the position of the manifold of the center. So the positions are randomly oriented in the space. We later on, I, I don't know if I have got time to it, uh, talk, uh, talk, to, uh, talk about it, but in, in real life, they're not random. So there is extended theory of how to take into account the correlations, but that's for now think about them as kind of spread uniformly in, in, in the space. And also the orientation is kind of randomly. So they, they are oriented this way, the, this of the, the variability, this d-dimensional stuff is oriented in different ways. So that's, uh, seems to be quite good um, approximation in real life, but that's, we make this assumption. And then uh, finally, um, uh, I, I just, uh, another notation is, uh, is the capacity alpha. So alpha is 
the number of manifolds divided by the number of neurons in that, in that area that participate in this representation. So what I called N. So P is the number of manifolds and N is the number of uh, dimensions. Uh, in this, uh, or the number of neurons that participate in this representation. And <clears throat> in the first question is, if N is large and P is large, um, can actually alpha, the ratio between them, be uh, the order one? Can you separate uh, the number of manifolds that you can separate in N dimension, does it scale linearly with the size? So if you increase the size, can I, in proportion, increase the number of objects that I can separate in this way. Okay, so uh, the answer is yes. And uh, let me just uh, give you, uh, again, kind of historical context. This problem had been, uh, had been solved years ago uh, in points. If you just have points in P points, randomly labeled in N dimension, no manifold, just let's say random points spread in n dimension, and you color half of them is red and half of them in blue, then you can ask the same question, how many points you can separate in by, by hyperplane? And the answer is well known answer is that it's, it's two, P over N is two. So if N is 100, you can separate with high probability up to 200 points in, in 100 dimension by a hyperplane. <clears throat> so that's, so, so that's nice. If you, if you multiply the number of neurons, if now the number of nodes is 200, so now you can separate 400 points in, up to 400 points in, in, in high dimension. This is, this is a regime where it's, it's efficient in the sense that you really use the degrees of freedom to your advantage. So if you increase the number of neurons, you, you in proportion increase the, uh, the functionality. Uh, so can you do it also in uh, in uh, uh, in manifolds? So that's not clear because each manifold may have infinite number of points. So now you're separating infinite number of points, but they are organized in those manifolds. So the question is how many manifolds per neuron can be separated? So here's some limits. I, I, I just go I, I, in, in, very, in very briefly. If the manifolds are very small, so imagine you take the size of the manifold and you collapse them to a point. Well, then we are back into the point problem. It's easy. Then alpha p over n is two. Conversely, if the manifolds are in low dimensional, but they are large in extent, then it's easy to show uh, that the, uh, now you are separating manifolds from each other. So it's two over one plus two d, very simple argument. So now you see it's kind of one over D and D may be large. So may, D may be 100 or, 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 or 200. So now the capacity drops dramatically like one over D. Now there is another interesting limit. Suppose I have these manifolds and each manifold is a, a cloud of N points. Only a set of discrete number of points in each manifold. And now you're, you're asking, what happens if I just randomize these points? I, I just shuffle. So there is no really structure. It's just random collection of points that arbitrarily I organize them in, 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 in uh, I, I call them manifold, but they're not. So then it's easy to see that in this case, the capacity will be two divided by the number of points in each one of these clouds, in each manifold, it is M, okay? So you see the conclusion is very simple. So if the manifold, if the capacity, uh, if the manifolds are either too large, very large in their extent, or they are random in their, in, in their structure, then the capacity will be very small, it will be either proportional to one of the dimension, if the dimension is high, or proportional to the number of points in each one of the manifolds. If the, if, okay, so if the number of points is high, like an image net is maybe 1000, then again, the dimension, the, the capacity will collapse. So this will be the tangled regime, and the untangled regime would be the case where the capacity is order one, which means that those manifolds are not random. The points in the manifolds are not random; they're well structured, and furthermore, they're not infinite in the extent. They are not only low dimensional, but also are, are, are sufficiently compact so that the capacity will be order one. So theoretically. 
from the theoretical perspective, if we are in the regime where the capacity is all the one, we are happy. Not all the one of the dimension, not all the one of the number of points. Number of points can be infinite, the dimension can be high, but still capacity is all the one. All right, so <clears throat> I, uh, again, uh, time is short and I, I want to uh, show you uh, uh, how to apply it. So I just uh, want to summarize another chapter of the theory, which says uh, we, we are uh, introducing introduced uh, a measure of the size of a manifold, which we call manifold radius, denoted by Rm, and also the uh, effective dimensionality of a manifold. <clears throat> the reason why we need effective dimensionality and effective size or manifold radius and manifold dimensionality, because sometimes you may have manifolds which are residing in 100 dimension, but there is very little variability in 80 of them and only significant variability in, in 20. So the dimensionality will be an effective dimensionality rather than literal dimensionality. And similarly, the radius may be you have to take into account only the, 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 the most uh, some part of the manifold which really take part in this computation. So there is kind of effective effective radius. <clears throat> so I won't go into the definition of manifold radius and dimension. It's an important part of the theory, but I am going to show you the result, the very simple that once you measure the dimensionality and radius of a manifold, it's a very nice approximation, uh, approximate formula for the capacity of the separating those manifolds. And this is simply given here. So you can easily check that when the product of the manifold radius, manifold size, and the dimension, square root of the dimensionality is, is significantly bigger than one. We are in the entangled regime, and when it's less than one, we are an untangled regime. That's important because we can actually look at the manifold and look at the, at the geometry of the manifold and immediately say, what will happen if I'll have many of those objects in my representations how many I can classify, I'm putting this into the formula algorithm. I don't have to really do the job of looking at the manifold and the representation of all these manifolds and simulate or do what. We can just plug into the formula <clears throat> and get the capacity. So to assess the capacity of a given layer in the brain or in, or, or in, or in the artificial networks, all that we have to do is to look at, at typical representative manifolds and to assess their geometry, their radius, and their dimension. All right, OK. So uh, good. So let's, let's uh, stop here in the theory for the lack of time and then, then see how can we apply those theoretical uh, concepts uh, to get uh, uh, insight into, uh, into uh, object, uh, object representation. So there are two theoretical tools. One is the notion of capacity, which is in a given layer, how many manifolds per neuron, P over N, can be separated if I randomly label them and try to linearly separate them. The, the uh, measure of their separability, linear separability. And the other one is their geometry. What is the radius and dimensionality of the manifolds? Okay. So we go back to, uh, to this image net data. Uh, here's kind of character two of these manifolds. Each manifold consists of I don't know, up to 1,000 points. Uh, and, um, and here's an example of the result. Um, so uh, what we do, we, we apply those theoretically defined measures to each one of the stages. And we want to see what happens to the representation from the perspective of these measures. So here's an example from uh, AlexNet. So this is the input layer. And this each point here on the x-axis is different layers. And here, just look at this. This is kind of the capacity. So you see that the capacity is low in the pixel layer. Actually, in the pixel layer, is almost like random collection of points, two over n, which I mentioned. And then the capacity steadily increases uh, up to the uh, uh, top layers. Uh, and 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 similarly, uh, uh, the, the dimension uh, start from high, high numbers and then go to uh, low numbers. And similarly, the radius uh, uh, consistently goes down. 
Uh, here is an example of uh, a more uh, impressive example from the uh, ResNet 152, very, very long uh, deep network. Uh, and you can see a very systematic increase, gradual incremental increase in capacity in the separability of those manifolds. Uh, th there are ticks where there is upticks of the of the capacity, which had to do with downsizing, downsampling in the architecture. Uh, and then towards the end, there is a, a, a kind of exponential takeoff, if you want, an increase in the capacity in the last layers. Uh, uh, conversely, the radius goes down again in steps, incremental steps, and then uh, towards the last layers and similarly dimensionality. All right, okay. Uh, one important point, I said that the, the theory is about random position of manifold. The manifolds are not random, and we can take this into account. And interestingly, that's another feature, important feature of what this uh, uh, deep networks are doing to the correlation between manifolds. So the manifold, actually start pretty high co highly correlated in the in the in the retina or the pixel layer and they are essentially decorrelated uh, strongly uh, along the uh, along the different stages all right so what we uh, have here uh, is kind of a macroscopic perspective of what those hierarchies are doing to object representations in terms of shrinking the size represent the radius in terms of flattening it dimension so radius goes down dimension goes down and and consequently the, uh, the, the their separability the ability to separate between them uh, goes up all right untangling so now the question is is it some something like this also happens in 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 cortex okay so that's how the problem there is ongoing work, uh, most of it unpublished. Uh, all of it is actually unpublished. That we have looked at a, a different uh, collection of uh, of data from uh, IT cortex and uh, other areas in human cortex, um, uh, and uh, and some in 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 uh, in, in primates and and uh, rodents. Uh, and I, I I just want to show you one example which is i think is a nice example and this is from the uh, from the uh, work of firewall uh, and Chao, where they found patches in it cortex uh, of of, uh, of of monkeys which are uh, selective to uh, to faces uh, here is the uh, and they also recorded the activity of neurons responding to a set of images showing here uh, 28 uh, uh, different faces each one of them with, uh, with eight poses. So we can think about this is 28 manifolds. Each one of them is, because we don't have more data, each one of them is eight points. But still, we can ask how these 28 manifolds with eight points, each uh, uh, organized or uh, uh, represented in IT cortex. So uh, first of all, we found that uh, those patches are really organized in a hierarchy. So the capacity starts low in the first stage, then second stage, then, uh, then third stage. And that's nice because it's consistent with their conclusion uh, based largely on anatomical uh, 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 arrangements of these uh, patches. Um, secondly, we, we can uh, then compare the capacity of the, of the top layer within the face areas, this uh, around 0.4 or 5 or so uh, capacity, and we can ask, is this capacity similar to what we'll get if we'll pass the same images and uh, through uh, a deep convolutional network? So what we do, we take VGG phase. It's a network trained for face recognition. And then we, do, we, we, we apply our measure. And indeed, remarkably, we find at the top layers uh, a very similar uh, capacity. So it's, it's maybe accidental. We, we, we don't know yet, but it's remarkable. There is no free parameter. There is no tuning parameter. So we have the same numerical capacity in IT cortex uh, in phase area than uh, as in the VGG phase. Okay, and it's not it's not uh, generic because if you take uh, the same images and and process them through VGG sixteen, which is the same architecture but trained not for faces, but for objects, then you find the lower capacity even top layer. 
Okay, so so there is something in VGG phase which uh, in artificial networks which generates uh, a geometry of face uh, face representations which are remarkably or maybe coincidentally we need more data. Hopefully, we'll get more data in the near future and post and 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 look at it. Uh, similar to uh, to IT uh, face uh, face areas. Okay, uh, I would like to make one more uh, uh, point. Uh, time is is running short, but um, about uh, about another uh, another angle. To it. So if for up till now, what I said is okay. So I want to understand what IT cortex representation is doing to object. They are giving them a geometry compact geometry. Uh, uh, compact enough so that you'll uh, be able to do kind of high capacity uh, classification tasks, separating many objects from other set of objects in, in many different ways. Um, but one can also ask uh, a, a different perspective. Maybe the representation an uh, IT cortex should be measured uh, by its ability to learn new object, object which the system that the brain, the animals, we have not been exposed to, are not familiar to. So that's the problem of learning new object. And the question is, are these representations good enough only for the familiar or trained object, or they're also good enough to be able to enable learning, rapid learning of new object? In machine, vision, it's called the few-shot problem, few-shot learning problem. So here's an example. So uh, I, I guess most of you have not heard about Coati and Namba. So I'm showing you two images, one from Coati and one from Namba. And then I ask you whether the top one is a combat or a Coati or a Namba, okay? So this is, this is an example of a, a task of one-shot learning. I'm showing you one image, one example from one category, another example from another category. And I'm asking you is to, based on these two examples, one per category, can you classify correctly a new, uh, a, a new, uh, a new example? Okay, so, um, good. Uh, so, so this is called the uh, two-shot line. So here's more examples and so on. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I think it's a number, but I'm not sure even myself. Um, okay, so now the question is, uh, we can take deep convolutional networks and ask the following question. Those networks have been trained on the thousand categories of ImageNet. And all that we did uh, until now is talked about the representation of these thousand categories. But what about if I propagate through those trained networks images from novel held out categories that the network has have never been, has never seen and not trained, not only images that the network has not seen, but categories that, that the network has not, has not seen. So like chaotic and number. And then we can do the same game. If I look at the feature layer, the top layer of these networks, and I'm showing two images, I'm looking at the representation of these two images of the held out categories, and then based on them, I want to classify a new image. So that's how we do this. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the algorithmic uh, or computational um, uh, implementation of what's known in cognitive sciences, uh, in psychology and philosophy, a prototype theory of concept, uh, of concept learning. Because what we do, we took the images, the few examples that we show from one category and average them and, and generate a vector, a center prototype and take the similarly for the other category, other uh, uh, few examples, uh, sum them vectorially or average them and we get a center, another prototype and we take those prototypes and then simply every, every new example we cat categorize depending on whether it's close to the prototype one or the prototype two. It's a very simple learning rule. It's called prototype learning. And we ask whether on the basis of the feature layer, we can do well, perform well on this task by just doing prototype learning 
on uh, on this uh, uh, on uh, on these players. And indeed, the, it's remarkably successful, surprisingly successful. So you can see here the histogram. So we do it for many many pairs of handout categories and examples. We have enough of them. Okay, so you can see the, the performance is 98% based on here on few shot learning of five examples per category. If you look at the pixel layer, the performance is 66%. If you look at the top layer of untrained deep convolutional networks is 56%. So it's amazing uh, uh, accuracy for doing uh, non-trivial rapid learning of new categories that those networks have never been trained for. Uh, nevertheless, the representation that they, they are able to generate represent nice representations even of new objects uh, uh, to enable this learning. Okay, we have a theory for that. We don't have time. Uh, let me just show you uh, 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 just one more Last point is, we we we, we went even uh, to a, a more extreme task, which is, can we combine language with vision for rapid learning of new categories? So that's called zero shot learning. What does it mean? It means that, that I, I I I'm I'm presenting two categories, like new categories, like Kroati and Nambat again. But I don't show any images of them, any examples, any visual examples. I'm giving the subject or the machine a, a, a linguistic descriptors of these categories. Like you show a ringtail, mammal, and so, and so on and so forth. So I'm giving zero-shot learning, no visual examples, only uh, a, a language uh, a, a description. Can I use? language information to, to actually be able to enable, now I'm showing an image to tell you whether this image is a character or number, zero shot learning. Learning visual objects from linguistic descriptors. Now again, I was, I was sure this is total failure. How, how are we going to combine, what's, how, you, how do you do it? Now, it turns out that uh, you, 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 you all know today we have, a word embedding uh, uh, software where uh, you can uh, you can have a, a vector representation, kind of distributed representations of words in a word embedding. Let's think about it as a language area in the brain where neurons respond to uh, to words in kind of distributed manner, and we take then the uh, for for the train network, so, so this is what you see here. So we have thousand categories that the network has, is familiar with. For each one of the categories, we have the visual representation. We take all the images of the visual representation of a category, sum them up to generate a center or a prototype from the trained ones. Here you see it here in the visual representation, IT representation. And correspondingly, we take all the words corresponding a descriptors of a category from the trained one, and we get thousand vectors in word embedding. So we have thousand prototypes in the word embedding and thousand prototypes in the visual embedding of the trained categories. Then we train a map. We find and optimize a linear map. Actually, it is rotation between these two representations. So once we have this rotation from the trained in, uh, data, we freeze this rotation, and now we can do the zero-shot learning. Now we have a new vector in, or two vectors for quality and number in the world embedding. We apply the linear isometry or linear or, or rotation to, to embed those vectors the language vectors into the visual representation in the top layer. This is these vectors, and now we any 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 image we can then categorize according to prototypes generated by language rather than by visual example. And this would seem to be fantasy, but again the performance is not not dramatically lower than five shot learning. Here it is ninety three percent accuracy. So the, again, the, the, what we see here 
is not only, or, or this a theory that IT cortex generates sufficiently nice generic object representations that not only uh, are capable of rapid learning new concept for a few visual uh, experiences, but can also learn new categories by cross-model knowledge transfer from, in this case, language uh, representation. So uh, I think it's time to, uh, uh, to conclude. Um, I am, as a, as a theoretical physicist, a statistical mechanician uh, in, my, in my background, I'm, uh, this is my, my intellectual bias to, uh, uh, to look at the uh, theoretical underpinning of uh, empirical observation, whether they are experimental neuroscience or they are uh, psychophysics or, or they are empirical computational numerical uh, observations from artificial networks. Uh, but it's a very rewarding uh, that, uh, that we can push the theory uh, to not only to kind of random Gaussians or binary or whatever, like the old work that you will love so much, but also to, to uh, data which has rich structure, geometric structure and correlation structure, uh, like a realistic structures in, in this case, uh, a visual object. Um, so the concept of geometry, um, uh, reformatting uh, measured by, uh, by um, randomly labeled uh, labeling of, uh, of object and measuring their separability in, in, con in, in the context of uh, geometry. I didn't have time to talk about the um, the understanding of how one stage from one stage to the next the geometry changes uh, this requires more details of the nonlinearity and the pooling the averaging that uh, th those uh, those stages are, are uh, con contain uh, but we have been able to map uh, kind of more microscopic uh, characterization of those uh, of those operations. What a nonlinearity does to the geometry, what spatial pooling uh, is doing to the geometry, etc. Um, and uh, remarkably, we find that concept manifolds in high-level sensory stages share similarity across modalities. So that's that's a suggestion or hypothesis, but the empirical evidence that we have from our experiments with vision and language uh, uh, is suggestive. Um, it's interesting that it, all that I told you about is not sensitive to if you take this deep network or slightly longer deep network or slightly shorter deep network uh, and, uh, and the tantalizing similarity with data, restricted amount of data that we have from the brain suggests that there is something generic in systems that are neural-like to some degree, you know, those artificial neurons are doing some operations like neurons that do spatial averaging or spatial filtering. They have a safety field, they have a convolution, they have nonlinearities somewhat, they have normalization maybe it's similar to what we find in the brain. So those operations, atomic operations or atomic units are somewhat similar to the brain. The architectures are still simplified. There is no recurrent, or most of them don't have recurrent, uh, and there is no top-down versus bottom-up. So there is, the, the architectures are much more reduced uh, than, uh, than the real brain. But nevertheless, the fact that all those different systems are showing similar macroscopic uh, qualities of uh, object representation suggests that there is something generic about uh, about this, that systems that differ in uh, in, in many details, uh, but nevertheless, all of them are trained or are born or develop or whatever to uh, uh, for uh, for object recognition tasks uh, generate enormous similarity in their uh, representation of objects. Uh, so, um, high perception cognitive functions may be explainable at the population level. So people, a lot of people give, give up on explaining. They say, well, deep convolutional networks are terrific 
they're doing wonders, but they are as mysterious as the brain. We cannot, we don't have a hope to understand them, and, and we don't have a hope to understand the, the brain. We just have to take it for granted. These systems somehow are doing the job. And I think this is, or at least I, I think this is uh, too pessimistic. Uh, with uh, with with the theory and with uh, uh, good numerical tools, we can make progress in uh, understanding both machines, and and this will help us also in understanding brains. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chaim. It was uh, very stimulating and very clear. I do have a couple of questions, but I would like to give priority maybe to students, if students have any questions, or otherwise other, other guests, but uh, students, do you wanna speak up, unmute and ask a question? Or anybody, so I don't put anybody on the spot. So if you have a question, just unmute yourself and hopefully there won't be any chaos here. I know Sharon had a question, she's still here. Gil, go for it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chaim, for, for, the, for the great talk. Um, I'm a cognitive developmentalist. Um, I study how children uh, develop concepts, uh, how babies develop concepts. And my question for you is uh, whether you would have sort of an extension of this theory to cases of learning, where it seems to me there's a whole lot of less, a, a whole lot less structure. Um, because it, it seemed to me that there, there are there were some assumptions, at least sort of in, in the models that you presented, of sort of the manifolds being there already, or in a sense, sort of the, 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 the system already knowing what the prototypes are, or the system already knowing sort of what the categories, the linguistic categories are. Um, and I am interested in, in how, how do we learn those, right? I mean, how, how do we learn how to parse the visual world into perceptual manifolds, or again, into linguistic concepts. Um, so, so, I don't know, your thoughts on that. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, if, if to those of you that may have missed the point, I, and many when, when I give the talks uh, are confused about that, uh, and just to, to, to kind of highlight the, 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 your, your point, what we are doing uh, is, is taking trained or what's called pre-trained network. We are not, not doing the training. We're just taking downloading networks that have been trained for this image net or, or other other competitions. Okay, um, so I didn't. So the, so I, I I didn't really attempt to compare the way those networks have been trained to biological or to real real learning or development. And I think that's a very important problem. And, uh, and more so because, uh, you know, those of us that know the details of how those networks were, 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 were trained, the algorithms known as backprop is, is very not biological or biologically plausible. But it's more than that. What, what you are saying is the training, with whatever the algorithm is, the training is what we call supervised training. We, we, during training, you show an image and you say a dog, and you show an image, you say, this is a cat, and so on and so forth. So it's fully supervised. And you're asking where the labels came from. Okay, partly philosophical questions. If we, I would say part of it, because of the, the last part of my talk, I'm, I tend to say part of it is language. Okay, now you can ask where categories came from language, in language. That's how the problem, of course, because language is categories. Um, but in any case, I think that we learn or we develop this high level uh, 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 cognition, visual cognition together with language. Okay, so interaction between them. That's one point. Another point which I want to, to say, it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively recent development in AI, which is the uh, training of those networks to, to perform very well on this kind of image net-like task uh, by unsupervised learning, okay? So the idea, the, the, roughly the idea is, in, during training, you don't show any labels. 
you just saw a set of images. However, what you do, you take each image and you distort it. Okay. And, and what the network is trained for, the task for the network is to just, you, you present two images to the network and the network has to say whether the two images belong to each other or not. Not to a category, just whether, whether they, one is a distorted version of the other or it doesn't, it's not, it's belong to another image. So it's completely, it's what's called self-supervised or unsupervised learning, okay? So it turns out you, 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 have, to, you have to do uh, engineering of what type of distortion to do and there are a lot of tweaks and tricks that you do, but it turns out that it works. That again, amazingly enough, you train the network to do this contrastive task, unsupervised, unlabeled, and you look at the top layer Okay, and then after training, we just train a classifier at the top, but you don't do any, but you, the, the, the rest is, is, is what you got in, in, in this uh, unsupervised way, self-supervised way. So that suggests that, uh, that the, 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 there is some hope, right? So, so uh, you don't necessarily need to actually learn in kind of brute force supervised way. Even, even the machines can do it from scratch. Um, so that's actually uh, uh, the engine or the, or the new idea that, uh, that is, uh, uh, is uh, common to the very recent modern monster-sized networks uh, that are trained in language and cross-model and vision and many other things. Uh, most of them use this concept that the, the networks are trained for generic kind of sensible by task. Suppose it's a language, you just train to predict the next word in the sentence. That's all. And you do it for millions and maybe of sentences, and then you find a translator or, uh, you know, a categorizer or whatever. Um, so, uh, so we don't yet understand the power of that. Uh, you know, it's, it's all empirical uh, anecdotal evidence, but it does suggest that, um, uh, that unsupervised learning uh, closer in spirit to, to human learning or development uh, may be the key. Thank you. Uh... I wanted to say one more question, but I see two interested people, so I do want to give them the opportunity. So if you have a couple of more minutes, I uh, would like to ask them. So Yarden, are you around? You want to ask a question? Daniel is raising a hand. Yeah, I know, but Yarden was before, and I wanted to see if he or she wanted oh, to ask I see. I'm Did sorry. I, I didn't see. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. So Daniel, go for it, and this will give your then a chance to say if he or she wants me to read the, her question on their behalf. But sure. Daniel, go for it. Okay, thank you very much, Haim. Um, I'm particularly interested in your novel object recognition part of your talk. And I wanted to understand more about where that capacity comes from. And I suppose it seems to me there are two possibilities. One is that what you're describing is architectures which are just so good at generically untangling, they can untangle anything given whatever structure you, you, there is in the data to begin with. Another possibility seems that the reason why you can distinguish the Kawati from the Numbat is because the untangling you've done in your, say, image net data has the same sort of correlational structure as the things that define the many folds that define the Kuwati and the number. So is it more like the second example, or do you think that these networks actually eventually become so generically good at untangling, even if I made completely arbitrary objects from completely arbitrary categories, it would still succeed? I, I think the last one is the answer. Uh, it, it, it's uh, the example that you can see from the example, from the tiny example that I showed about a set of face images propagating into a network trained for objects. There are some faces also there, but mostly objects. And you could see that 
no it doesn't work and and uh it doesn't work as well at least and and for for no for for if i if i do that's interesting i didn't do it but i bet if i do the the rapid learning it will fail miserably okay so it does have to do with the fact that as you said that objects uh that this held out objects although there are new categories pizza airbus number or whatever but they have underlying the, the the collection of features which are generic to this type of object they, they they will not just do well for arbitrary manifolds absolutely not there's no way you could use your measure of sort of geometric separability as a criterion to train a network absolutely that's that's exactly absolutely this is i think the power of this method that we can actually use the geometric measure to characterize the generic structure or nature of object representation trained or held out or whatever we actually we actually i didn't show it but we actually measured uh, i didn't show it here but we measured this radius and dimension and so on for held out and they are very similar to to uh, to what we get for the trained one it's not only the 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 accuracy in in, in terms of fusion learning but also the geometry of the ge objects in the held out are very similar to those for trained and by the way i just want to to comment they are not perfect there is some overfitting if we increase the number of objects so now we're doing training our own training we add to image net thousand more objects and train them okay the the geometry still improves so so it's not the end so we can even get better performance by adding more training okay so it will be interesting to see the asymptote at some point it will say okay this is okay it's 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 stationary okay but but even with the even with the thousand categories of of the image net the amount of overfitting the amount of discrepancy between trained and held out is is small thank you very much thank you Chaim, i'll just ask a quick question so there's a difference between object categorization and object recognition it's not an intuitive difference but it's a it's a significant difference and i wonder if you see your theory is also helping us recognize or there's always the bad guy the best instance that you need to distinguish from i mean it, it seems that incorrect yeah go ahead. it seems like yeah well so from from so i don't know actually how to maybe you can help me how to conceptualize the difference except for that if i want to recognize an object uh, that's a question so to me it is a matter of the following thing if i want to recognize an object i basically want to say whether this is a new object or one of those that i'm i'm familiar with so you can say it's it's again pairwise or, or separation or separation out of many uh, as opposed to separation of you know 50 from 50 or 100 from 100 uh in 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 the theory we call it sparse labeling versus unsparse labeling uh so so in 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 the theory it is a matter of degree rather than a matter of principle so actually the theory that developed allows us to give sparse labels so we can say well can we separate 10 out of 100 and so on and so forth but I, but we don't see a, a qualitative a conceptual difference between the tasks so i may be wrong i may be missing something but uh it, it's it's yeah so but you, you should tell me if there, maybe there is a way to formalize object recognition as 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 a, as a different task but uh, but right now it doesn't seem to us to be as essentially as an essential difference then it might it might seem to that we can talk about this offline but basically I'll, I'll be happy to i'll be happy to because that's where we're interested to actually enlarge extend the ensemble of object like computations that we can uh that will be interesting to enrich the theory also 
we'll do this when you come back home. And now I see there is daylight already. So it reminds yes, me. That's that right. The, so I, I remind you. I'm about Filat Shacharit. <laughs> okay, so let me not stop you from there. I want to elaborate on the differences, but we can do this. When yeah, we... I'll be happy to to discuss. Okay. With you. Yeah. okay, thank you very much again, Chaim. We appreciate thank you. Thank, thank you all. Have a safe trip. Thank you all. Have thank a you. good Shana Tova, good academic year. Thank you, you too. Yeah. Bye.